Good afternoon and welcome to our Chats in the Stacks book talk, The War That Made the Roman Empire, Antony, Cleopatra, and Octavian at, at Actium by Barry Strauss. I'm the moderator for today, Virginia Cole, and I'm the Archaeology, Classics, Medieval Studies, and History Librarian at Cornell's Olin Library. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayocono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayocono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayocono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayocono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. The Chats in the Stacks series started back in 2001. Through this series, Cornell University Library strengthens scholarship, sparks thoughtful dialogue, and grows a community of readers and critical thinkers. Thank you all very much for coming today. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Barry Strauss and welcome him to a command performance for the Olin Book Talks. He has introduced three of his books here in the past, Masters of Command, Alexander, Hannibal, Caesar, and the Genius of Leadership in 2012, The Death of Caesar, the story of history's most famous assassination back in 2015, and 10 Caesars, Roman emperors from Augustus to Constantine, most recently in 2019. Professor Strauss is the Bryce and Edith M. Bomar Professor in Humanistic Studies and is affiliated with three Cornell departments, History, Classics, and Archaeology. He is the former director of Cornell's Peace Studies program and current director of its program on freedom and free societies and a graduate of Cornell University. Strauss has written many books and more than 60 articles and reviews on various aspects of ancient and modern warfare, including the Spartacus War, 2009, the Trojan War, A New History, 2006, and Battle of Salamis, the naval encounter that saved Greece and Western civilization, 2004. A widely recognized expert on military history and theory, he has appeared in numerous television documentaries, has published op-ed pieces in the Washington Post, LA Times, and Newsday, has been interviewed on NPR and the BBC. He is the host of the popular new podcast, Antiquitas, Leaders and Legends of the Ancient World. Strauss has been awarded fellowships by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Academy at Rome, the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, and many, many more. In recognition of his scholarship, he was named an honorary citizen of Salamis, Greece. Please welcome Barry Strauss. And at any point during the talk, if you have questions, please type them into the chat and Professor Strauss will answer as many as we have time for. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you for that very uh, warm and generous introduction. Uh, and thank you everyone for being here. It's a great honor and pleasure to be back in chats, uh, be back in chats in the stack. Um, today I'm going to talk, stack, chats in the stacks, excuse me. Today I'm gonna to talk about my, my new book, as Virginia said, um, The War That Made the Roman Empire. Um, and I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. So as my students know, I love PowerPoints. The war that made the Roman Empire um, is about the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Uh, and I wanna acknowledge something as well as, as in addition to Virginia's very moving comments. Uh, today, uh, March 24th is the one month anniversary of the beginning of the current war in Ukraine. It's a very baleful thought and uh, we can only hope for peace as soon as possible. And I hope that looking at this ancient war will give us some perspective on understanding war today. My book's called The War That Made the Roman Empire, Antony, Cleopatra, and Octavian at 
Actium. Uh, and here you can see, I think that the, um, the art department did a really nice job in designing the cover. But some of you may ask, as a, a prominent Cornell alum asked me today, well, what is Actium? Here's another uh, image of what it might've looked like. This is an 18th century painting. But Actium was a battle in the ancient world in Roman times. It took place on September 2nd, 31 BC. And it took place off the Northwest coast of Greece, uh, off a town called Actium and not far from the island of Corsaira or Corfu, which many of us know from tourism. Uh, it was a tremendously significant battle, and we'll talk in a moment about its significance and why I consider it a significant battle. But first, a little bit about how we know about Actium and how uh, it appears to us today. We know about it, first of all, through Shakespeare, through Shakespeare's play, Antony and Cleopatra. It very much shapes our notion of Actium, of the players in it, of course, the two um, ones who give their names to the play. And we also know it through countless Hollywood productions, most famously or infamously, depending on your point of view, the one uh, involving Elizabeth Taylor, Cleopatra, the early 1960s Hollywood movie that was a great scandal at the time. But Actium's not fiction. It's a real story. And a great deal was at stake in this battle in September of 31 BC. What was at stake was the future of the Roman Empire and in a way the future of our, of our civilization. Not to leave you in, not to give away the punchline, but Octavian and the forces of the West win. They defeat the forces of Antony and Cleopatra. If the battle had gone the other way, if Antony and Cleopatra had won, then today, well, after that, Alexandria and not Rome would have been the center of gravity of the empire. The center of gravity would have gone from Rome here to Alexandria in Egypt. Today, we would be speaking a Greek-based rather than a Latin-based language. And our civilization would have more than one foot in the East. Our civilization would be based on something more like Orthodox Christianity rather than Catholic Christianity and its Protestant offshoot. But the war didn't go that way. And so we want to understand why it did end up the way that it did. And that's what I propose to talk about. So the players of the war, the characters who are involved in it are so interesting that we could focus simply on them. This, first of all, is Octavian. Uh, that's what historians call him in the early part of his career, but he'd already adopted the name of his adoptive father. He called himself Julius Caesar. He was Julius Caesar's great nephew. And when Caesar died, when he was assassinated in 44 BC, in his will, he named uh, his great nephew Octavian as his uh, uh, adopted son, posthumously adopted son. So he was known as Caesar at the time, and he was the leader of the forces of the West. And then there was Mark Antony, who was the leader of the forces of the East. Like Octavian, he was a Roman, but he was a Roman general in charge of the Eastern part of the Mediterranean. Like, like Octavian, he was associated with Caesar. He was also a relative of Caesar. He was a distant cousin of Caesar. Uh, and he was disappointed upon Caesar's death not to have been recognized in Caesar's will and not to have been adopted as his son or not to have been recognized as his successor. But he had gone off and created a new empire of his own, not quite an empire of his own, but a power base of his own in the East by making an alliance with the most powerful ruler of the Roman East, uh, the uh, monarch of the only major independent kingdom in the Roman East, and that was Cleopatra. We see her here in a bust in the Vatican Museum. It's one of a number of images of Cleopatra that survives today. Many of them are controversial. Not all art, art historians accept them. This is the one that most art historians accept as a Greco-Roman um, visualization of what Cleopatra looked like. Cleopatra was a, a woman of many parts. She was the queen of Egypt and she spoke Greek. She was descended from Macedonians, but she also spoke Egyptian. And there's a plausible argument that part of her ancestry, indeed her mother, uh, might have actually been Egyptian. In any case, 
Cleopatra represented herself as an Egyptian, as well as a Greek or a Roman. And here we see Cleopatra on the wall of the Temple of Dendra. Cleopatra is to the left. Here you can see she looks every bit like an Egyptian. And beside her to the right is her son. And thereby hangs a tale. He was her oldest son. She had three other children, two sons and a daughter by Mark Antony, who is not only her partner, but her lover. Um, but her oldest son was the result of an affair with none other than Rome's dictator, Julius Caesar. She named the boy Ptolemy Caesar. He was known by one and all as Caesarian. And although Caesar never officially recognized him as his son, he allowed Cleopatra to use the name and he allowed her to be represented in Rome uh, with her son in, in her arms in a very prominent place associated with Caesar. And this brings us to one of the great themes of this conflict. It was a conflict over who would rule the Roman Empire. Would it be ruled by Octavian in the West or would it be ruled by Antony and Cleopatra in the East? And the war, which was very much a, what we call today a shooting war, a kinetic war, a war, war that involved actual fighting, was also a, a war of information, a war of misinformation, a war of propaganda. I like to think of it as the first postmodern war. And what was the propaganda about? Well, on the one hand, it was about who was the heir of Julius Caesar. I've already told you that Octavian called himself Julius Caesar and expected to be hailed as Caesar by one and all, but Cleopatra disagreed. She said that he wasn't the real son of Caesar. The real son of Caesar was her own son, her birth son, Caesarian. And she and Antony represented the real heritage of Caesar and it was located in the East at Alexandria. Octavian more than returned the favor. When he declared war, on Antony and Cleopatra. He didn't declare war on Antony. His rival was Antony. Antony was the man in charge of the Roman army and navy in the East. But instead, Octavian declared war on Cleopatra. Why? Well, for one thing, it was highly politically incorrect for Octavian to have declared war on another Roman because Octavian had sworn after winning a victory in an earlier civil conflict that he would never engage in a civil war again. And for another thing, Cleopatra was a foreigner. She was a Greek, she was an Egyptian, and she was a she, she was a woman. And all of those uh, offered a richer target for Ro Roman propaganda than did, uh, than did Mark Antony. So that's why Cleopatra declared war on, uh, excuse me, that's why Octavian declared war on Cleopatra rather than on Antony. Cleopatra, as I said, was the queen of Egypt, and Egypt was no ordinary kingdom. It was the wealthiest place in the ancient Mediterranean, and Cleopatra was in charge of a treasury that was truly a king's or a queen's ransom. Whoever had this treasury would have the power uh, to do things that nobody else in the Mediterranean world could match, which was one of the reasons why it was such a great coup for Antony to become her partner. Now, those are the um, best known people in the story, but there are several others, three others that we need to talk about and that a lot of my research is focused on. I wanna give you just a little taste of what my research has been about. One is this woman. Um, this is a, a copy of a bust from uh, the period we're talking about, uh, the 30s BC, and she is Octavia. She was the sister of Octavian, but she was also the wife of Antony. She was something like a mafia bride. Octavian married her off to Antony as a peace offering between these two rival warlords in the Roman world. And most of the scholarly, uh, most of the ancient sources depict her as the perfect wife, loyal to a fault to her husband, Antony, uh, for whom she produced two daughters and by whom she was betrayed for the evil Cleopatra. Well, as you might guess from the tone of my voice, this is a propaganda version of the story. And indeed, almost all of our information uh, is uh, a product of the uh, Octavian's propaganda machine. So it's very difficult for us to reconstruct the truth. And one of the things I had to do as a historian was to try to do just that. In fact, um, 
uh, one of our best sources for ancient Roman history, the historian Tacitus, describes the marriage of uh, Octavia and Antony as a, uh, a dangerous relationship, a, um, I can't really think of the word in English, but an entangling relationship, a tricky relationship. And indeed, I would argue that Octavia, rather than being the perfect wife, in fact, was working ultimately for her brother. And there are lots of reasons to think that. And she fed information and helped her brother and was a useful uh, tool in the propaganda war. Well, the next person who we have to add to the story is this man, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, uh, in this bust, uh, also perhaps from a slightly later period. Uh, the bust represents him as uh, a blunt military man, which indeed he was. He was Octavian's best general. Octavian fought in battles. He wasn't a coward, but he was not a great commander. He was not a great general. Instead, he had the advantage of having the services of Agrippa, who was a boyhood friend of Octavian and was uh, an all around military person. He was a great land general and also a great admiral. And it was he who led Octavian's fleet to victory uh, at Actium. So a very important character indeed. Now, in doing my research, I may, took advantage of the latest archaeological work. Um, the site of Octavian's headquarters uh, at the Battle of Actium was on land, uh, and it was later turned into a shrine of the place that Octavian built, which he called Nicopolis or Victory City. And what's really interesting for the uh, point of view of the historian, one of the interesting things is that the shrine was lined with about 35 rams that were captured from Antony and Cleopatra's ships. These rams have been studied in detail by my colleague and fellow graduate student long ago, uh, Professor William Murray of the University of South Florida. And his research has done a, a great deal in allowing us to reconstruct what actually happened in the battle and what Antony's real strategy might have been. And here we're looking at the view towards Actium from uh, Octavian's headquarters, which are right up here. I took this picture from Octavian's headquarters. We're looking downhill. Uh, this is the Gulf of Ambracia and Actium is located over there. Well, one of the things that I most enjoyed focusing on in writing this book is the run-up to the battle. Because Actium, the story of Actium is not just a battle, it's a story of a military campaign. And like most battles in history, we can only understand the battle within the context of the campaign. Uh, the war began uh, more than a year before the battle took place, and it lasted for another year after the battle. But what was really crucial was the six months uh, up, that ran up to the battle. The battle took place, as I said, on September 2nd. If we can turn the clock back to March, which we're conveniently in, March of the year 31 BC. Now, contrary to the picture that we get from the surviving ancient sources, this battle is not going to be a slam dunk for Octavian and Agrippa. In fact, Antony and Cleopatra had more money and more ships and better ships. Their ships were state of the art. They had reinforced prows and they were better able to ram uh, than the enemy ships. They had about 500 warships to 400 warships on the side of Octavian and Agrippa. And their ships also had the ability to break through harbor defenses that would have allowed them to invade Italy at one of these two ports, Brindisium or Tarentum. Agrippa knew this and he sold to his commander, Octavian, a plan, an audacious plan to take a small fleet, maybe as few as 40 warships with 5,000 men, 5,000 um, legionaries on it, maybe somewhat more, to sail in March, the beginning of the sailing season, when it's still a bit risky, uh, to sail south, to skirt the islands of Greece so they couldn't be seen by Anthony's men on these islands, and to go not to the shortest distance from Italy, but to the longest, to go nearly 400 nautical miles all the way down here to the southwestern Peloponnesus to a place called Methoni. Why Methoni? You may have heard of Actium, but I'm pretty sure you've never heard of Methoni. Here's Methoni. You can see it on this modern Greek, Greek 
uh, roadmap, you'll notice that it's in the southwest corner of the Peloponnesus, and that gives it a strategic location. Antony and Cleopatra's army, like all armies and navies, traveled on its stomach and lived on its stomach. It had to be fed, and there wasn't enough grain or resources in Greece to feed it. And so it depended on a long supply line that went back about a thousand miles to Syria and to Egypt. And the supply line went across North Africa, to Crete, to the islands, to the south of the Peloponnesus. And the crucial node on this network was Methoni, because Methoni was the place where you went westward in the Peloponnesus. Whoever controlled Methoni would be able to control the enemy's food supplies. And Agrippa followed the advice that the Romans had been following for centuries, so here we see it in a later source. A great strategy is to press the enemy more with famine than with the sword. Cut off the enemy's food supply and you can defeat him. And that's what Agrippa proceeded to do. And this brings us to the fourth uh, character, or pardon me, the third character was not usually in the story. That's a man named Bogood. Pretty sure that you've never heard of Bogood. Bogood was the king. Here you've seen the name Bogood Rex. He was the king of Mauritania, roughly uh, Morocco, roughly Morocco here, uh, as you see on this map. And the coin shows not Bogood. Alas, we don't know what he looked like. He was uh, but rather it shows Africa, uh, a personification of Africa, wearing uh, the, um, the skin of an elephant. Bogud was a Moor. Uh, the Moors were a people in ancient Morocco. Uh, they were a mixed race, part African, part Mediterranean. Um, it's a reasonable guess that he was dark skinned, but we're not really sure. We really can't be sure what he looked like. In any case, he'd been the king of Morocco. He'd been the king of Mauritania, excuse me. He was an ally of first of Julius Caesar uh, and uh, then of Antony. He lost out in a war with a civil war with his brother, who was an ally of, um, of Octavian. And uh, Bogud was forced to go into exile and he fetches up in the Actium campaign. He is put in charge of this very important supply base at Methoni. And that's where Agrippa sails against in March of 31 BC. Now, how does Agrippa manage to take Methoni? Because that's precisely what he does. He captures this all important supply base. He defeats the defenders there and he kills Bogud. How does he do it? If only we knew. The ancient sources are all but oracular. We've only got four lines about this important battle, which we, we wish we knew so much more about. Uh, one of them, the earliest one, comes from Strabo, a contemporary of Octavian. And he says that at Methoni, during the War of Actium, it was here that Agrippa, after he took the place by an attack from the sea, he put to death the man he calls Bogus, king of the Marusians who belonged to the faction of Antony, an attack from the sea. Another source written centuries later, Cassius Dio. Agrippa captured Methoni by storm. He killed Bogud, and now he was waiting, watching for the merchant vessels that came to land and were making descents from time to time on various parts of Greece. Indeed, he cuts off Antony's grain supply. Porphyry, writing even later in the, um, around the third century uh, of our era. This is a book about vegetarianism, believe it or not. And he says that Bogus, he calls him, was killed by Agrippa at Methoni. And finally, an early Christian writer after the year 400 says that Agrippa crossed the Gulf and he stormed the city of Methoni, which had been fortified with a very strong Antonian garrison. Well, none of this tells the historian exactly how Agrippa pulled it off. I tried to reconstruct it in my book, and I do so both by studying uh, ancient amphibious attacks, which we know something about, and also by working with modern amphibious warriors. I consulted Marines, and I consulted, dare I say, Navy SEALs, and they all had some insights 
Of course, ancient warfare is very different than modern warfare. And I uh, had to make uh, allowances for the differences, but they gave me some ideas as to how uh, Agrippa might have done it. If you look at this map, you'll see that south of Methoni, there are these two islands. And these islands, uh, particularly this one, Sapienza, uh, was a pirate hangout in early modern times, a pirate cove. My guess is that Agrippa across the Ionian Sea. Uh, he came at a time of the quarter moon, which is perfect for raiding. You can see the enemy, but they can't see you that well. Yeah, he took refuge in Sapienza and with the help of local pilots, one day in the pre-dawn hours, he attacked Methoni. Here is a closer view of Methoni Castle. You can see it's on a promontory. And here is what the site looks like today. It's a Venetian Ottoman fortification. Very beautiful if you ever get a chance to go there and a wonderful place to go swimming. And here is the island of Sapienza over here. So I imagine, I can't be sure, but I imagine that uh, Agrippa carried out a surprise attack on this fortification. And although it was well fortified, it was not fortified by heavy infantrymen, by legionaries such as Agrippa surely had with him. They were able to take the place, kill the ruler, and start a chain reaction, which cut off Antony and Cleopatra's food supply. They were attacking the enemy strategy, attacking the enemy indirectly and setting things up for the battle so that they would have the benefit of a level playing field. And now uh, we come to Aptium. So in the, months, in the months between March, when Agrippa took Methoni and September, when the battle took, took place, Agrippa goes on and continues going on a series of raids around Greece and particularly in the Corinthian Gulf, cutting off more of Antony's supplies. Um, after the taking of Methoni, Antony and Cleopatra had to send their supplies up here to the Saronic Gulf and ship them overland and then into the Corinthian Gulf. And then um, when uh, Agrippa makes that more difficult, they have to send them even further north and overland to Actium. It means that Antony and Cleopatra's men at Actium, where their feet, fleet is based, are going to be poorly fed and the morale is going to suffer. We also think that they began to suffer from illness, probably from dysentery. Meanwhile, Octavian, with the rest of his fleet, had crossed the Ionian Sea and um, had ensconced himself north of Actium. Here's Actium, here's where they crossed. And here we have that view again from Octavian's headquarters towards the site of the battle. And here we have a close up. And these come from my book. These maps come from my book. You can see Antony and Cleopatra's camp. But here's Actium itself, a small town. You can see Antony and Cleopatra's camp, which is on the south side of the entrance to the Gulf of Ambracia which is what makes Actium such a strategic place because they could keep their fleet in here. They also built a second camp on the northern side, northern promontary on the entrance of the Gulf. And Octavian was located about five miles away up here in the hills at a place called Mikolitsi. At first, Antony and Cleopatra might've thought they had the better site because Octavian did not have a great place for his ships. The Bay of Gomorrah was exposed to the winds. But in fact, up at Mikolitsi, Octavian was um, invulnerable. Antony wanted him to come out and fight, but Octavian refused to do so. And once Agrippa captures the island of Lucas, he's got an excellent port there, which can serve Octavian just as well as this, I'm better actually than this port in the Bay of Gomorrah. So slowly over these months, uh, Octavian and Agrippa squeeze Antony and Cleopatra. And slowly, their men begin to desert them, contingent after contingent. Antony challenges Octavian to a land battle, but Octavian is too smart to accept that. Rather, he knows that he can squeeze the enemy out indirectly. Finally, we come to the uh, end of August, and Antony and Cleopatra hold a council of war with their remaining allies, and they realize that they have no chance of continuing to survive here at Actium. They need to leave. 
And so they decide they will fight a breakout battle on sea, at sea. They've still got an army with them. In theory, they could march overland, but it'd be very difficult terrain for them to march in Greece, heading towards the east. Um, and um, they really would be unable to feed themselves or escape back to Egypt, which would be their headquarters. Even more important, Cleopatra had with her the bulk of her treasury, and that's what Octavian really wanted to get. And she felt they would be it would be safer at sea than on land. And so we come to the time of the battle, which was fought on September second. Now, a couple of interesting things to take and keep into account, take into account, because we won't have time, of course, to go through the entire battle and entire campaign. First of all, on the eve of the battle, Octavian comes up with a plan, and it's the wrong plan. He says, let's let Antony and Cleopatra escape, and we'll, we'll control all of this area, and we'll deal with their fleet later on. Agrippa, his second in command, says, boss, that's a terrible plan. We need to fight them right here at Actium. And now a really unusual thing has happens in the history of strong men and dictators, because Octavian was in effect a dictator, Octavian listened to his number two. He said, Agrippa, you're right. You're the military expert. And instead of insisting on doing things his way, instead Octavian listened to Agrippa. It's one of the reasons why Octavian, for Octavian's greatness, uh, because he, he knew his limitations and he had the right number two and he knew when you had to listen to his number two. Antony and Cleopatra come up with a pretty good plan of, of their own. Um, it's a plan basically for a breakout battle. Uh, they sail out of the Gulf in the morning of September 2nd, and they line their fleet up between around here and around there. Um, and they challenge Octavian and Agrippa to a naval battle. In order to man their ships, they were so low on manpower that they had to burn a lot of their ships. As I said, they originally had 500 warships. They're now down to 230 warships. They originally outnumbered the enemy. They're now outnumbered by the enemy who have 400 warships. Antony and Cleopatra are going to attempt to fight a battle. They're going to attempt to use their heavier ships and their reinforced prows to ram, break up the enemy's fleet by ramming it. Agrippa's too smart and too experienced. He stays a mile away, a nautical mile away from the enemy, making it impossible for them to carry out uh, a successful run up to Agrippa's fleet. Instead, they're forced to do a breakout battle. They've prepared for it by bringing their masts and their sails up along on their ships, which you usually don't bring into a naval battle. Uh, this allows them to escape quickly. If you read Shakespeare, the battle devolves because Cleopatra uh, becomes a coward and she leaves Antony, her lover, in the lurch. That, in fact, is not the truth. In fact, Cleopatra is carrying out a prearranged plan. She is uh, an admiral who carries out her plan uh, precisely and with great success. And I think one of the reasons she's so successful is because the Romans underestimate her. They refuse to believe that a woman and an Egyptian could carry out such a brilliant plan, but she does. And Antony goes on, leaves his ship for her flagship and they escape. They lose most of their fleet, but they escape uh, to go back to Egypt. That's the good news for them. And that's what's successful about what they did. But overall, the way that Antony and Cleopatra ran this campaign is a textbook in how not to run a war. They've got the money, They've got the highest tech weapons and they lose. And the reason that they lose is they simply are not up to running what then was the complexity of a modern war. They engage in an intelligence failure by underestimating the enemy. They engage in a leadership failure because there are cracks in the coalition and Antony and Cleopatra want different things that we could talk about in the Q&A. And they engage in a strategic failure because what we learned from the rams of their, their ships is that they had the capability of launching a raid on Italy, an attack on Italy, not a raid, uh, by, of taking a fortified place by storm and bringing the war to the enemy. Instead, they stayed in Greece and they uh, violated one of the first rules of warfare. 
seek a quick victory rather than engaging in a protracted battle. They, instead of having um, troops that were ready and eager to fight, they had a demoralized army and navy whose resources were depleted. Well, they went back to Egypt and there Cleopatra in particular tried to make a last ditch effort to succeed, uh, but she failed. And here are Antony and Cleopatra on coins in the, uh, you can see in the Chicago Art Institute. Uh, it's kind of a remarkable image of the queen there and of Antony on the, on the other side. And here is their, one of their resources. They issued coins for their very large contingent of men showing their fleet, showing their resources, uh, rightly priding themselves on what they had. This one says Antony the Augur, Antony the religious official. But alas, um, they misused these resources and didn't, didn't use them successfully or properly. Here is Agrippa. Here's a uh, early modern engraving of what Agrippa might have looked like, the hero uh, of Octavian's success at Actium. And here another view of the site of the battle. Well, back in Egypt, within a year, Octavian uh, invades Egypt with all the help of Antony's former allies in the east. And um, the result is preordained at this point. Antony's surviving men defect to the enemy. There's a warship from um, that we might have seen at Actium. This comes from a relief south of Rome and it's in the Vatican Museum. Uh, you'll notice that they have a tower that's used uh, for um, shooting arrows and there are heavy armed Marines on the ship and perhaps suggesting that this was an Egyptian ship because you see the, the crocodile. And Actium, sunrise at Actium, we're looking off the shore looking at the shore, excuse me, looking from off the shore. Okay, this engraving, Antony committing suicide in the arms of Cleopatra. You all know the story from Shakespeare and Cleopatra follows him as well. With their deaths, the independence of Egypt is no more. Egypt is annexed by the Roman empire. Octavian becomes all but the Pharaoh. Cleopatra's son, Caesarion, is captured and killed when Ant Octavian's tutor makes the wicked, cruel um, statement at the time to justify it. Too many Caesars is a bad thing. Too many Caesars is a bad thing. There's only one Caesar left. That's Octavian Caesar. He takes the surviving children of Antony and Cleopatra and brings them back to Rome for his triumph. And you know the rest of the story. Octavian becomes the Emperor Augustus. And here you see uh, one of his coins depicting a triumph, one of his triumphal arch for his success at Actium, and his success in the war against Antony and Cleopatra. It's truly the war that made the Roman Empire. It's the war that gives us the Roman emperors. It's the war that turned Octavian within a few short years into Augustus, uh, a living legend the first of the Roman emperors, the founder of a dynasty, and that turned Antony and Cleopatra into, alas, the subject for tragedy and film and poetry and memory as we know them today. I trust that the Battle of Actium, however, is a subject that will help us understand more this all too enduring phenomenon of war. Thank you. That's my dog. All right, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. You're um, so cool. <laughs> we are now ready for questions, and I have a number of them. So I'm going to get started. Mm -hmm. Um, Jonathan Ebenezer ask, some of the descriptions of Antony suggest that he loved to drink, party, and enjoyed the good life. I was wondering how much of this interpretation of his character was shaped by subsequent propaganda and how researchers separate fact from propaganda when reading ancient sources. 
Thank you. That is a great question. It's certainly everything we know about Antony and Cleopatra, except for these contemporary coins, uh, are um, uh, uh, the subject of ancient propaganda of uh, Octavian and then Augustus's propaganda. And it's our job as historians to, to always challenge the sources. We can't take them literally. Uh, we can't accept what they say. We have to read through the lines. We know, for instance, that uh, part of Antony's propaganda was to depict himself as the uh, representative on earth of the god Dionysus. Dionysus is also known as Bacchus. We know him as the god of wine, but he was also the god of liberation and the god of the conquest of Asia, and a god who was associated with Alexander. Uh, Augustus's propaganda, Octavian's propaganda, would only remember the first of those things and say that Octavian's just a drunkard. You can't give him any power. You can't let him be the guy who runs uh, half of the Roman Empire, let, let alone all of it. Uh, and uh, Antony wrote a reply to this called On His Drunkenness, On His Drunkenness. He knew, um, he knew that um, uh, what, what, I, what Octavian's propaganda was. There still seems some evidence that Antony's a guy who liked, enjoyed a good time. He certainly was one of the boys when it came to his troops. But we have to be very suspicious of the image of Antony the drunkard that we get from, uh, we get the, from the surviving sources. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> another question. Uh, Pam Baxter asks, who uh -huh. were the other allies of Antony and Cleopatra that you mentioned? Uh, thank you, Pam. Yeah, there were a number of allies of Antony and Cleopatra. First of all, um, a large part of the Roman Senate supported Antony. That's not the usual story we get, but um, if something like a third to or more of the Senate flees Rome uh, to join Antony and his campaign. Uh, they really prefer him to Octavian. As for the rest of the senators, Octavian turned them into virtual hostages and forced them to go off to the war with him rather than staying in Italy, which was really unheard of. Uh, so Antony had a lot of support within Rome. In the East, there were a number of kings of states in the East who supported Antony. Antony had done a really good job of building up client states for Rome. Uh, he was an excellent diplomat during his time in the East. The most famous or infamous of them is King Herod, um, the infamous King Herod of the Bible. Uh, he was on Antony's side, but maybe not wholeheartedly. He got along with Antony, but he and Cleopatra hated each other. Cleopatra wanted his kingdom. She wanted Antony to give her Herod's kingdom. Antony refused. So Herod sent troops to support Antony and Cleopatra, but he actually himself stayed home. He, he wasn't there. Uh, this is from Kevin Treadway. I once read that following his victory at Actium, Octavian permitted at least the centurions of Antony's army to join Octavians as a symbolic reunification of the army that campaigned under Julius Caesar. Was this mainly a political propaganda ploy, given that the army would have, would have many soldiers mustered out and given land at the conclusion of the civil wars? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So uh, Octavian basically accepted virtually all of Antony's soldiers. He negotiated their surrender. Uh, there were a few uh, prominent men who he had killed, but mostly he, he accepted Antony's former allies as his allies. The number of reasons for this, first of all, this is uh, the golden age of treachery in Roman politics. It's a period when um, more people switch sides than really any other uh, that we know of. Um, so it makes a lot of sense. Uh, also, uh, Octavian wanted to have these troops on his side. Um, the only problem was he then had to find land for them as the questioner suggested. And that's one of the reasons why he needed Cleopatra's treasury. Uh, he needed uh, not so much for the land, but he needed also to give them bonuses. And he didn't have the money to give them bonuses. He didn't have a lot of money. In fact, to pay for the war, he had to raise taxes in Italy, uh, which led to riots and violence and strong opposition to him 
Um, so his political position wasn't really all that strong. Uh, Lindsay Powell uh, says, great talk, Barry. Um, Agrippa featured prominently in your lecture, yet you admitted omitted him from your subtitle. And I'm curious why. Uh, because he is, uh, first of all, thank you, Lindsay. Lindsay's written a great book about Agrippa. Uh, maybe I admitted him from my subtitle so people would read your book, Lindsay. Uh, but also because um, I wanted to uh, highlight the people who were best known to the public, Antony, Cleopatra, and Octavian. Um, I used the book to bring in Agrippa, and who is underrated, and Octavia, who is underrated, and Bogood who um, was not in their category, but it's just a fascinating uh, example of, um, of Mediterranean politics in this period. Aidan Ackerman asked, how do you think that imperial holdings would be partitioned between Roman and Egyptian rule in the event that the war was won by the Eastern forces? Well, that's a great question. I'm sure uh, the lion's share of these uh, holdings would have gone to Rome, but Antony and Cleopatra had plans for their three children, each of whom was going to become the ruler of, uh, or the co-ruler of uh, empires in the East, kingdoms in the East, not to mention, um, not to mention um, uh, Caesarian, who would be the ruler of Egypt. Um, we have to assume that they would have had a lot of power and uh, might have exercised that power. Uh, and also Cleopatra was a great strategist and she would have been looking out for her children. So although I can't answer the, your really good question uh, precisely, uh, I, we, I, I, I'm pretty sure that these, the children of Antony and Cleopatra and uh, the descendants of Egypt would have a lot more power uh, than Egypt ever did in the Roman Empire, when it basically was a privately owned possession of the Roman emperor. Um, Philip Nicholson mm -hmm. asked, can you tell us a bit more about the actual naval battle of Actium after Cleopatra and Antony departed for Egypt? Yeah, great question. So after Antony and Cleopatra departed for Egypt, the participants continued to uh, fight in the battle. Antony and Cleopatra's men uh, didn't give up. Um, you know, we are really so much at the mercy of the, the sources that come from Octavian's side. And Augustus wrote memoirs. Uh, he wrote his memoirs, including an account of the battle. Those memoirs don't survive, except for a very few quotations from them, but we can be pretty sure that they affected other sources. In fact, in at least one case, the source tells us, I read uh, Augustus's memoirs. Um, but if we're to trust the memoirs, Octave, Antony's men kept fighting. Some of them didn't know that he and Cleopatra had left. Uh, supposedly, Octavian tried to go around and tell them, they've left, stop fighting, uh, but they didn't. And uh, I, Agrippa and Octavian end up using fire arrows uh, to set fire to the enemy ships. They certainly didn't want to do that while Cleopatra was there with her treasure. They didn't want to do that while she was there with her treasure. But after the treasure was no longer an issue, uh, by setting fire to the enemy's ships, um, they could be sure to defeat them. Uh, and they would send some of them to uh, the bottom. Uh, and it's a way of finally ending uh, this, this, this battle that's still going on. The sources claim that at the end of the day, which would have been around eight o'clock in that time of year, uh, Augustus, excuse me, Octavian still wasn't 100% sure that he had won. And he spent the night at sea, uh, just in case there, was, there were hostile ships uh, in the vicinity. It was a very hard fought battle, even after Antony and Cleopatra left. Um, all right. Um, Michael Davis asked, what caused the second triumvirate to fail? It survived for a decade, but was it doomed from the start? Uh, great question. I would say, given everything we know about Roman politics and the Roman personality, yes, it was doomed from the start. Uh, Rome wasn't big enough for 
to first men. And again and again in Roman history, um, these alliances had uh, led ultimately to civil war. So highly unlikely that it could have left, could have lasted. Why did it last as long as it did? Um, because both Antony and Octavian were busy. Uh, Antony was setting up new uh, systems, of, a new set of alliances in the East for Rome. And he also wanted to make war on the one remaining great kingdom that could challenge Rome, the one pure polity. And that was the Parthian empire to the East. Octavian had to deal with, uh, with problems. First, a rebellion in Italy itself, a rebellion that had Antony's fingerprints on it, or at least those of his first, his then wife, Fulvia, and his brother. Um, and then he had to deal with uh, an even uh, bigger problem, and that is the, the surviving son of Pompey the Great, uh, Sextus Pompey, uh, who had uh, the Roman world's strongest, the central Italy, Mediterranean strongest navy, uh, and who ruled a, 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 a naval kingdom from his base in Sicily, and was able to cut off the grain of Rome, the grain supply to Rome. Octavian couldn't do anything until he settled those two problems. Uh, and it was only his ability to do so that allowed him to then turn on Antony. Grace Ryan asked, had Antony and Cleopatra won? You mentioned Alexandria would become a center of influence as opposed to Rome. Yeah. Would they have tried to take over Roman territory? Would they have tried to make um, Caesarian a ruler of Rome? Or would Roman opposition <laughs> to foreigners be too great for that? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I think Antony would have been the equivalent of Octavian in Rome. Uh, the Roman Senate would probably have had might well, I should say, might well have had more power than it did under the Caesars, but Rome would have been ruled by the Antoni. Uh, Antony had uh, a, two Roman citizen sons of his own. Um, he was not going to have his sons by Cleopatra uh, ruling Rome. Um, Antony, um, excuse me, um, Alexandria was tremendously culturally influential in the Roman Empire as it was. And what we call the Roman Empire was really the Greco-Roman Empire in many, many ways. And later on, of course, a uh, ultimately a Greek sitting speaking city would become the greatest city in what had been the Roman Empire, and that's Constantinople. I think that uh, if Antony and Cleopatra had won, Alexandria would have become a Constantinople before Constantinople, before the letter. I think that's what we would have seen. The, certainly culturally and politically, culturally definitely the empire would have looked eastward, politically in some ways as well. Um, I think we would have seen a Rome that made a major effort to fight the Parthians. Uh, it certainly went back to fighting the Parthians in the later years, but we wouldn't, I don't think we would have seen an effort to conquer Germany. I don't think the Romans would have been very quick to conquer Britain. I think they're, uh, the, the impetus would have been in the East. The center of gravity would have been in the East. Uh, Jonathan Chin asked, to what extent was Actium modified by Shakespeare? How did historians determine erroneous description from sources and distinguish them from accurate descriptions? great questions. Uh, well, Shakespeare, you know, was really an excellent reader of history. He was very accurate. He's a model for all of us. Uh, but he didn't have the sources of evidence that we do or the uh, centuries of scholarship that we have. His main information on Antony and Cleopatra came from Plutarch. That was his main source. And Plutarch's life of Antony is probably arguably Plutarch's literary masterpiece. It really is a masterpiece, but it's very biased and it's very pro-Octavian. Uh, Shakespeare is following that. He's also following Octavian's line, which is extremely unfriendly to Cleopatra, shall we say. Uh, he sees Cleopatra as, uh, Plutarch sees Cleopatra as brilliant uh, and beautiful and charismatic and charming, uh, but also cowardly at Actium um, and not to be trusted. 
So the Shakespeare says that Cleopatra just fled in cowardice uh, from Actium. Uh, the Battle of Actium itself uh, is not that big a part of uh, Shakespeare's play, though he certainly refers to it. Uh, we can't follow that. It's not a uh, reliable source. But uh, I would be lying to you if I didn't say, say, admit that I think that my interest in the subject, my image of the subject, and I think all of our interest in the subject is influenced by Shakespeare and his the stunning poetry of the play. Um, I have a question from Tracy Matrano. Mm -hmm. The BB series Rome yeah. captivated my attention as it did many of us. Yeah. And when it came out, um, she asked, how authentic was it in your view? Yeah, I captivated my attention as well. Um, so it, it was, you know, in some ways, ways in which it wasn't authentic, it basically made the Roman Empire all about sex. And although the Romans weren't prudes, uh, no, um, that's not accurate at all the way they had it. And particularly Octavian's mother, Atia, um, uh, they really went to town with her and made up all sorts of things. Uh, there's a lot of accuracy in other ways, though. Um, I like, I really like the portrait of Caesar. I like the portrait of, of, um, of Antony. Um, uh, wasn't quite as taken with their Cleopatra. One little detail. So, so a couple of other things I really liked about it, it really showed the Roman Empire as the multicultural and multi ethnic empire than it was. If you look at it and compare it to I, Claudius, another great BBC series in the 70s, it's such a different Rome uh, that you get uh, in uh, BBC Rome. Um, and also you get a sense that uh, poor people played a very big part of Rome. Uh, one of the details I thought was so great about it was the way they portray slaves. And they have this detail of slaves who don't even get rooms of their own. They're sleeping on the floor, they're sleeping in the hallways, and they're sleeping in the master's bedroom while the master is uh, making love to the mistress and nobody bats an eyelash. I suspect that was the reality of, of, of the slave system in Rome. And it, you know, it was just a massive slave society. Um, since you mentioned um, I, Claudius, Richard D. D. Donato asked, uh, I'm a big fan of the fictionalized history by Robert Graves, mm -hmm. I, Claudius, and Augustus was a great character in that novel. Mm -hmm. How much can we rely on the novel factually? Well, I'm a great fan of the novel as well, but I don't think we can rely on it factually. Um, I mean, the most, one of the most fun but egregious things in it is the portrayal of Livia. So um, Olivia is Augustus's wife. Uh, I didn't mention her today. She doesn't play that big a role in Actium, but she plays a huge role in Augustus's reign and his career. Um, the novel follows hostile sources, in particular the historian Tacitus, uh, who portray Livia as a monster uh, and a poisoner who killed off uh, the males of Augustus's family who stood in the way of her own birth son, Tiberius, becoming the emperor. Uh, we have to be very skeptical of that. Livia was a power broker. She was a brilliant woman. She was Machiavellian. She was a politician, but she was not a poisoner. So we have to be skeptical of, of that as well. Nor was Augustus, uh, the, a little bit in the novel makes Augustus kind of, a, uh, kind of a Mr. Magoo or Elmer Fudd type who's pushed around by Livia. Uh, I'm kind of skeptical of that as well. She was tough. She was a tough lady, but uh, I think Augustus is pretty tough too. All right. Um, I've got another question from Kevin Treadway. Yeah. How many an Antonia dominated empire, how, how may an Antony dominated empire have developed politically in your view? Would it, have, would it have been as vulnerable to many of the same destabilizing elements as the empire that was first ruled by the Julia Claudians was. Do you think it may have been more author authoritarian due to greater influence from Egypt and the Near East? That's a great question. You know, it's a counterfactual his historical question. And first, a modest answer, I don't know, and we don't know. 
Um, I'm not sure it would have been more authoritarian because um, in spite of Cleopatra and the influence from the East, Antony was a Roman noble. Um, and I think he might have given more power to the senators and also might have spent more time in the East and not be so interested in Rome. So in a funny way, it might have been less authoritarian than the rule of the Caesars was. But you're right to suspect that Cleopatra's influence might have shaped things. Uh, it's certainly a good argument that one of the reasons that Julius Caesar uh, flirted with being a king uh, is because of his, uh, his mistress Cleopatra and her influence. I imagine Cleopatra saying to Caesar, I don't get it Caesar, if you're so great, how come you're not a king and a god? I'm a queen and a god, everybody is anything, anyone should be a, a monarch and a god. So yeah, it's a real possibility. Right. I hear the um, bells chiming here at Cornell on campus for five o'clock. Um, I am, unless you want to go um, take one more question, Professor Strauss. Sure. I'd be happy to take one more. Question. Okay. All right. This is our last question. So this is from Jonathan Chen. Mm -hmm. To what extent will you agree or disagree to the argument that there is a similar uh, that a similarity existed between Cleopatra and Helen from Homer in terms of offering excuses to the war, providing monetary incentives and other aspects? That's a really good question. Um, we don't know, of course, that Helen was a real person or not, although, although that I, I have argued she might be based on real life Bronze Age uh, queens in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East. Uh, but yes, I mean, for the Romans, Cleopatra is kind of an anti-Helen. Uh, she's more of a, a witch as they portray her. But for the people from the East, and this is something that I think that a lot of historians have missed, um, she was very attractive. She was the goddess Isis. Egyptians worshiped her. Um, they followed her gladly. And Isis was an immensely popular deity around the Mediterranean. So uh, for instance, while we're often told that uh, Octavian's, uh, Antony's decision to divorce, divorce Octavia was a terrible move uh, that her, hurt him in terms of propaganda, I'm not sure that's true. I think it might have helped him because it made him closer to Cleopatra and also because it told the people from the East that he was making a credible commitment, that he was all in on the side of the goddess Isis. So yes, I think she was very important as a symbol of the war. Thanks for that great question. All right, so we're gonna end on that note. Um, I just want to thank you very much, Professor Strauss, for your very great talk. You're welcome. And I want to thank, your, thank the audience for joining us today and for their great questions. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.